Thanks very much for having me here tonight, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Mi'kmaq and the Innu ancestors on whose unceded land we've gathered tonight. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginals from the Pilbara, with whom I've had the opportunity to work uh, in Northwest Australia, and whose story and homeland uh, I'm going to share with you tonight. Australia may be on the far side of the world, but it's the kind of place that we all have our own sense of. We all have an idea of what we think Australia is. Perhaps it's a vast red continent, something like what we see here. Perhaps it's something much different. Uh, I hope tonight's lecture is an opportunity to move beyond some of these typical cliches and uh, learn something new. Uh, my focus will be on Western Australia, which, as the name says, sort of is the western third of the country. Um, within tonight's lecture, I'd like to bring, on top of that, some historic and geographic context and focus in on the Pilbara region, which is located right through here on the sort of <clears throat> upper shoulder of the Western Australia and talk about how this experience has been both unique and also quite familiar in comparison to uh, previous work that I've had the opportunity to do uh, throughout much of Canada. So quite literally, Nova Scotia is as far away from Nova Scotia as you could get and still be on dry land. I don't need to remind my mother of this. Um, if we were to dig in the middle of Husky Stadium, we might pop out somewhere off the, uh, just a bit south of uh, Perth, which is, oh, I've lost my mouse. Anyway, uh, Perth is in the, essentially just above the little hook in the lower southwest portion of, uh, of Australia. There we go, right there. Um, for any of you who've dug into Burt, you weren't going to end up in China. You were going to come out somewhere near about where I did. Um, population of Perth is about 2 million, which uh, is pretty significant because in the whole state, there's only about 2.6 million people. So despite being the second largest state-based jurisdiction in the world, it doesn't have the largest population. It's in fact 18,600 18, kilometers in any direction from Halifax, uh, which takes about 26 to 40 hours to reach, depending on your connections from Halifax. Now, while the distance is great, there is a surprising amount of common ground. Uh, both Canada and Australia have history of British colonies. In fact, Captain Cook has a direct connection to Nova Scotia and Eastern Canada through uh, the conquering, uh, uh, the, the takeover of, of Canada from the French. He was part of the survey and landing crew at Louisbourg, uh, took part in the blockade of Quebec City, and did extensive survey work around Newfoundland. Uh, this, on top of uh, this experience as a surveyor and navigator, made him the ideal candidate for sending overseas to the Pacific, on top of the fact that he was nobody's son. Both countries have displaced indigenous peoples um, who were highly disrupted by the uh, arrival of strangers and settlers in their lands. Both countries have broad, uh, vast landscapes which are both blessed and cursed with rich national resor natural resources. Additionally, both continents are blessed or cursed with extreme temperatures. Uh, of which I've had the opportunity to enjoy both ends of that spectrum. <clears throat> and additionally, <clears throat> in relation to what we're looking at on the screen, um, both countries, uh, the West is where you go for work in archaeology. Uh, many people in this room, many colleagues that we've worked with, uh, have ended up going West to the oil patch uh, in, in Alberta and British Columbia. I've had some experience there myself. If we were telling the same story in Australia, 
many graduates from the eastern states in uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, as archaeologists, have ended up in the Pilbara, where uh, the heart of, of Australian industry has been based for some time. So between 2005 and 2015, the fast-growing economies of China and India uh, made a spike in demand for iron ore. Um, this also led to a rise in prices. It also ro rose, led to a, uh, an increase in job opportunities as local uh, vacancies couldn't be filled by the amount of people available uh, in, in Australia. So including co archaeology consultants, uh, companies began looking overseas to fill their needs in, of employment. In 2011, I arrived in Australia, but to my surprise, I was not the only Nova Scotian that I met there. <laughs> of even greater surprise, I was not the only Nova Scotian archaeologist that I had a chance to work with over there. When I arrived in the strange and forward land, uh, not so sure of all the do's and don'ts, Ryan and Jill uh, were both there to set me on the right path. Additionally, the story goes beyond that, I had the opportunity to work with two GIS specialist grads from COGS in Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia. So 18,000 kilometers away wasn't far enough to leave my roots, which was pretty special. The boom has a bust. In 2014, China's economy started to slow. They stopped buying. So the impetus for mining companies in the Pilbara and in West Australia slowed to the point where they were not actively taking on new developments, new expansions, uh, but were consolidating their holdings to focus on production. Now, this had varying effect on employment. Uh, those 2016 numbers, which finally fell after the, the maximum peak, may not be significant in the overall, but they do represent a, a significant shift away from growth. However, in the heritage consulting industry, uh, where we are a small community, changes like this are very significant. Um, we were dependent on these, the, the, the period of expansion and growth in greenfield development, uh, where uh, new and expanding uh, territory needed to be assessed, and suddenly those opportunities were drying up. So, that relate, uh, resulted in a number of layoffs. It resulted in um, shifts within company structure, uh, moving from uh, salary-based employment into uh, casual roles. Um, and also, uh, a number of companies had to close. Some of the big ones went from 50 down to five or six staff, uh, enough just to keep the lights on. So there was big changes uh, in the community, which, which had certainly ripple effects, um, causing a number of my uh, um, fellow workers and, and friends to return overseas to Scotland and Ireland from, from where they uh, immigrated along with myself during the height of the boom. So big impacts and big changes that came with the, uh, um, the shift in global economy, just sort of shows how we're all we're all tied into this, uh, this package together. Through the downturn, organization, uh, sort of companies like mine, uh, with Gavin Jackson, Cultural Resource Management, um, had to make adjustments. Thankfully, we had not expanded to a point where we were overextended. Uh, we did lose personnel. We did need to uh, tighten our belts, um, but through some you know, uh, fancy footwork and, and a lot of hard work, we managed to uh, um, keep going. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big issues was that as the expansion stopped, the contracts stopped coming. So keeping people busy uh, can be a challenge at the best of times, and certainly it was highlighted here. Um, however, losing staff these cutbacks and downward pressures being put on the company, still the clients wanted us to be operating at peak performance. They still wanted things 
as they'd always had them. They still wanted them done cheaply. They still wanted them done, you know, yesterday. And this became a real problem when, after weeks and months of nothing, suddenly you get two or three contracts that all overlap in the same week, which means suddenly you need to have three different teams available to go out into the field, and you can't, you know, line them up as you would just to keep your base team in, in, uh, active. So certainly it was, it was tough times uh, for managers and staff alike. And within all of this, there was other changes at, at foot. The West Australian Aboriginal Heritage Act from 1972 was being put under review. Between 2011 and 2012, the Industry Working Group Review of Approvals Processes in West Australia held a consultation process. Now, the title says it all, Industry Working Group. The voices of the Aboriginal community whose heritage would be considerably affected by the decisions and amendments that were being considered was ignored, as were the negative responses from the community of heritage professionals. However, consultations with the resource sector were extensive, and to no one's surprise, they were thrilled with the amendments that were being put in place. Some of them are listed here above. Approvals efficiency. We want to make it easier for new developments to take place, not get bound up in the, the green tape of environment and, and heritage concerns. They are going to uh, remove the, what little say Aboriginal people had in their roles for speaking out or uh, making decisions on the way their heritage was being managed. Uh, the new site registration process was being turned on its ear in the sense that the thresholds that were now being required were not only being raised, but were being inconsistently applied. Uh, we did our own self-experiment because getting answers was very difficult. Between 2013 and 2014, there was only 4% acceptance to the registry of all the sites that we'd been recording in the same way throughout the years previous. No solid answers were given as to why such a low return. And even in examining the sites that they had chose, there wasn't even strong consistency between why some sites which had excellent potential, lots of diversity, good condition, some of those are being accepted and rejected, while other small sites that had disturbance were being accepted and rejected. There was not a lot of clarity in the decisions that were being made. Finally, there was even sites being deregistered from the inventory, which had a lot of people concerned because who was behind, you know, well, how's the decision-making process in, in this capacity being, being conducted? Lots of questions, not many answers. Of biggest concern within all of this is that no one was very thrilled with the Aboriginal Heritage Act as it was anyhow. Um, the fact that the sites were not protected from, you know, the, no site is safe in West Australia because all a developer needs to do is apply to disturb it. And with the, the government uh, being on the side of uh, development and wanting to get those royalties, uh, there's very little that outsiders can do to prevent those developments from actually going through. Uh, Three percent of Section 18 permits, which are the permits required to disturb a site, uh, were rejected in a 10-year period leading up to and including the, uh, the initiation of, of the boom. The, the fact that very little consultation, no consultation was taking place with the Aboriginal communities, um, and such a low um, percentage of sites being inadequately presented, inadequately informed, um, certainly raises the question as to, you know, what would it take to get rejected? Um, three successful prosecutions in 30 years. Um, this is including entire mines being constructed where proper permissions uh, and numerous sites are being destruct, uh, destroyed. You know, we're not talking about a bulldozer going through and, and disturbing a few uh, flakes on the surface. We're talking about entire landscapes being modified 
but being approved. Uh, certainly, uh, when you look at what one West Australian Auditor General found, uh, his conclusions that the Department of Aboriginal Affairs have not been actively monitoring compliance, which is one of their primary roles. He also found that they did not review all the compliance reports that they were asked to. And when it, they found non-compliance, no action was taken to enforce it. So there was some clear ineffective approaches being uh, applied within Department of Aboriginal Affairs that raised concerns, as we said, through, throughout the heritage community as well as uh, within Aboriginal communities. The combined effect was that Aboriginal communities and groups began taking matters into their own hands. Any confidence that they may have had about the ability of the Aboriginal Heritage Act to provide adequate protection for their heritage was now undermined or eroded. They realized that reporting sites for registration was an, was an act of relinquishing all further rights and interests to those sites. Furthermore, they were giving up custodial control and responsibility for these places which is inconsistent with traditional law and custom. However, in an unexpected twist, as these new amendments were being sort of introduced and just tested, um, business remained the same. The big companies didn't take to the easy road that was being offered them. There was no mad rush to go blasting sites. They continued to follow in the existing interpretations of the act and what constituted a site, not what the new ideas were, the, the, new, uh, the new thresholds. It seemed from our perspective that the lawyers within these big companies had got whiff of the considerable liability and risk that the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and the Government of Western Australia was taking in their new interpretations and application of the legislation. The big miners have their own international standards for ethical engagement with indigenous communities and groups. They saw unnecessary risk in taking the easy road the WA government was offering. They were uncertain, uh, and they were also uncertain as to when these interpretations might start to swing the other way, and they've been overextended, and now liabilities start to fall their way. One of the things that for me stood out as a major difference, in fact, between West Australia and my experience in Canada is that there is no central repository for information or site materials. The um, WA Museum has some collections, but all artifacts stay on site and all of the report information stays with the clients. It's only upon application to disturb not identification, that this information goes to the government and they are able to then put it within their registry. But by that point, it's essentially representing the end of the line, that this site has now appeared, the public and government now know about it, just as the bulldozers and graders are coming up to, uh, you know, um, have impact. So a different theoretical, philosophical approach to the way heritage is managed to here, where the public researchers, consultants have access to databases of information, report records, and so on. And we don't need to go and engage every single client in order to get that information. Certainly it makes academic research and just general knowledge and acquisition a whole lot more straightforward here than it does in West Australia. So this is sort of the context of West Australia that I arrived in, but I'm going to take us step back real uh, for a bit of context on Australia in general. When I arrived, I knew very little about the history of Australia. So we're going to do our best really quickly to go through the last 70,000 years and bring you up so that we can then focus in on the Pilbara. <clears throat> so I'm just going to blaze through this, but uh, when I was learning it, it was kind of neat. This is the equivalent of Beringia, same kind of time periods. So 70,000 years ago, uh, we have people arriving into Sunda, Southeast Asia. 50,000 years ago, or perhaps a little bit earlier, we have people arriving into Australia. Um, 
The oldest site is, uh, for human remains is Lake Mungo here in the south east uh, in New South Wales. Um, a bit more of a detailed view. Um, there has always been an ocean gap between Southeast Asia and Australia. Um, so this has meant that people coming here have always needed to have a maritime adaptive strategy and capability. Um, some recent research has looked into uh, bathymetric data and sea level uh, landscape remodeling in which some of the uh, submerged um, islands have been uh, examined and established through some algorithms and, and I don't know the details of it but I found this during uh, putting this uh, material together that uh, identified areas that could be seen from height of land. So particularly in Timor and, and Rote, which is in uh, part of Indonesia, you could see from heights of land islands that would get you into Australia. And we're talking similar kind of crossings uh, or um, perspectives that we get when driving and you can look across the Northumberland Strait and see Prince Edward Island. You get that just sort of, there's just a haze, there's just a bit of a, 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 a thin line on the horizon, but you can tell there's something there. And people are curious. And in, when pushed, um, perhaps even by uh, one, one theory of, of pushing people um, further east is the eruption of uh, volcanoes in Sumatra that about uh, 75,000 years ago that change the climate, change condition, pushing them uh, to, to, to migrate further into um, to the east. So quickly, they're arriving in Australia, there are a few different models that have been uh, suggested as to how people spread across the country. Because interestingly, by 40,000 years, we've got site dates all over the country, uh, perhaps with the exception of the, uh, the, the pure interior. So, so, like I said, we have, Australia's a big country, it's got a lot of vast open territory. Establishing our parameters are still very limited and often date ranges are extremely broad. So calculating and understanding um, the fine points of human mobility and settlement patterns are still a work in progress. But uh, a lot of the oldest sites are in the far north. The oldest in the Pilbara has recently been reported at uh, Bodhi Cave on Barrow Island, which in the past was not an island, it would have been a, a hill. Um, but uh, between 50,000 50, and 30,000 years ago, it was a residential, uh, it was a hunting shelter and um, a residential base for family groups, um, reoccupied uh, about 8,000 years ago. So the cave is located uh, in the middle um, uh, escarpment on this, uh, in this photograph. By 45,000 years ago, global climates are wetter and cooler, uh, which intensified about 30,000 years ago. Um, at that time, we've got some of the earliest uh, rock art occurring in the Northern Territory. Um, by 25,000 years ago, the connection, the land bridge to, uh, to um, Papua New Guinea is beginning to recede, so narrowing. Uh, 20,000 years ago is the estimated date for images like these, or archaic faces um, in the Pilbara. And by 18,000 years ago, we've reached the LGM, the glacial maximum, so the lowest sea levels uh, in which uh, the most water in the world is occupied in the ice caps. So 18,000 years ago, this is sort of what we're sort of looking at, the dates for the earliest people, you know, just starting to, to um, think about North America, you know, uh, as, as some of those ice caps start to recede after 18,000 years ago. Um, so as I said, the, the, we can sort of see in this figure, uh, 25,000 years, it's a narrow land bridge to Papua New Guinea. 18,000 years ago, as the ice caps have expanded and sea level rises have fallen, it's a broad connection, which since 18,000 years has been slowly uh, receding to the, uh, the map as we would recognize it today. 
Uh, by 16,000 years ago, uh, the extinction of Australian megafauna is, is pretty well uh, confirmed. So in, that is a sort of, def generally megafauna is defined above 100 kilograms. In Australia, many of them were large, but still not that big, but a 40 kilogram, um, some of the, uh, the, there was various birds and marsupials, uh, sorry, yeah, large, like ostrich-like, um, you know, the, the, the emus continue today, but there was a number of, of megafauna that uh, no doubt with the significant changes in climate as well as um, human predation uh, led to their uh, final end, much like megafauna in North America um, sort of receded at about the same time. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, throughout the Pilbara region, only one site has established confirmed uh, continuous use throughout, you know, before, during, and after the, the glacial maximum. Um, it seems that these sites were, uh, it was, this was tough conditions, um, and that sites in the region are generally restricted to uh, areas that have really dependable resources, the most important one, of course, being water. Between 8,000 and 10 years, 1,000 years ago, um, weather gradually is warmer uh, and wetter. The ice caps are melting, and the uh, land bridges through the Torres Strait north to um, Papua New Guinea, as well as Beringia between Siberia and Alaska, have uh, are, are receding. Um, the lowland Pilbara is being reoccupied, um, and. There are different interpretations as to whether or not the uh, uh, people coming back into these areas was a rapid expanse or a gradual using specialized adaptations such as seed grinding. And we've got an example here of a really well used sort of two scalloped um, surfaces on a grinding base fragment, which all, you know, heavy polish, heavy wear, as well as uh, evidence of, of uh, pecking. So, um, really quite a nice piece, actually. Into the Holocene. Um, about 8,000 years ago, Tasmania, off to the southeast of Australia, and Papua New Guinea uh, are fully separated by, um, by ocean. About 5,000 years ago, the dingo has been introduced from Papua New Guinea as a hunting dog, so it seems there is still some connection with uh, Indonesia at the time. Um, 4,000 years ago, Australian small tool tradition, uh, which is a toolkit that we'll talk a little bit more uh, later in the lecture, but it is where, as archaeologists, we get a fairly diagnostic toolkit um, that helps us give a bit of a confirmed date range. Much of the Australian toolkit has items enter and then never leave, grinding bases being one example, that they sort of come in and then they're always used. There's no battleship curve in which you can get a seriation as to when, you know, the particular periods, because a, uh, um, a grinding base could be 1,000 years old, 10,000 years old, you know, uh, 30,000 years old, when these technologies didn't stop being used and weren't modified in such a way as to make them diagnostic. Um, 2,000 years ago, the thylacine, or the Tazi tiger, uh, is extinct on mainland uh, Australia. Um, it survives into the first years of the 20th century um, from Tasmania, hence the name. Um, but interestingly, it has been represented in rock art uh, through a number of areas throughout Australia. So uh, kind of neat when the details of the archaeology can be reflected in some iconic species, uh, <coughs> such as the Tassie tiger. Um, so about a thousand years ago, one of the uh, significant elements of the Australian small tool tradition, uh, backed artifacts, um, are uh, sort of falling out of use. Um, and we've got a fairly established population uh, everywhere. We've got higher rainfall. Um, we've got um, easier living in general just because resources and, you know, uh, just what has always been a harsh place has just been a little bit easier. Um, again, we'll talk about backed artifacts a little bit later, um, but you can, uh, the, the spoiler alert uh, is that these, uh, the two sides of the triangle represent the area where there's been heavy retouch. Um, 
the straight lateral side is quite sharp. Now, our understanding of these is that the retouch is actually not the active part, but the passive part. That is what gets set into a resin. So that extra flaking, and it's the thickest part of the flake, is used as a part of binding into lateral edges of a tool, such as a composite knife, composite spear elements, such as this. And that flat straight edge is your cutting and working edge. These would be frequently replaced. They're often discarded, but it's a, uh, an interesting tool type that sort of has a defined uh, uh, Holocene period uh, use. So within, um, with, with, within the uh, sediment models, you know, um, we are still piecing together the evidence. Um, one of the reasons is there's been so much archaeology done by consultants, but not a significant amount of academic uh, publication and synthesis. And as we spoke of earlier, getting access to the information required to do this is, uh, has its challenges. Um, but some of the interpretations put forward by uh, Brown 87 and Veth 93 present general models of settlement and site location based on core habitation sites and satellite task sites, sort of a, a Binford kind of model. Um, habitation sites in general throughout the um, Northwest uh, focus on reliable water courses, as you would expect, water sources, um, major drainages as both resource areas and travel. Um, you need to be able to travel where there's water to the next spot. Um, many of these uh, larger sites have high density, high diversity assemblages, um, diverse artifacts, materials, um, more complex reduction phases, not just testing, not just the finished product, but the whole thing. And a range of, uh, of uh, completed tools, not just in process. All of this demonstrates multiple tasks, multiple people, multiple visits um, over uh, multiple years. Specialist task sites um, are low artifact density, um, common along smaller water courses, sort of more ephemeral, more uh, radiating from the, the primary occupation areas. Uh, low density sites on the plains, for example, um, task specific, um, in some cases recognizably single events. You can see a single uh, stone has been tested uh, and there's nothing else. There's no other, you're not near. Any other water courses, it's a flat and featureless landscape, but you can see that walking through the country, someone picked up a stone, recognized it as having good properties, a few flakes were tested, and either it was kept or discarded based on the results of that process. But nothing else is around, you know, so you, you can get various scales of use and occupation, um, and some of them apparently quite brief. Um, again, less diverse assemblages, um, as I said, often single material, uh, cores and, and primary flakes, not getting into a lot of retouch, not spending a lot of time, uh, so end grinding material generally absent. Um, some of the other uh, just considerations in understanding the settlement process, uh, again, we talk about the value of water, you need to have um, Different times of the year, rains, you know, there's rainy seasons and dry seasons uh, in different parts of the country. Those are uh, different times of the year. Um, but those, uh, many of these water courses and many of the habitation sites are dependent on permanent water or uh, dependable water that uh, is perhaps an isolation, operates in isolation, kind of an oasis, uh, another way to consider it. Uh, at times of the year, they spread and these oasis can be linked up and in those wet seasons, you have the opportunity to move beyond your standard territory. Um, so sites with known little pockets fresh after the rain hold water that can make extending into the hinterland a sustainable and profitable enterprise because you're moving into areas that have not been over harvested resources uh, can be accessed that otherwise are too many days journey away from your home base. The other consideration is fire stick farming, coined by Reese Jones. Now, this is uh, Aboriginal, um, an Aboriginal process throughout Australia, um, certainly made famous in some of the early historic uh, 
by some of the settlers in, uh, um, on the eastern states, the east coast, were observing that as they arrived in Australia that it was a parkland, the mature trees, clear undergrowth, and this is largely a result of frequent burning. So uh, we know this happened here in North America as well, that maintenance of uh, undergrowth uh, has a way of rejuvenating the landscape, presenting you know, opportunity for new growth and perhaps valuable growth. Uh, this is a bush tomato uh, plant um, that was used as a, uh, a food source. Um, it also opens up the new green shoots that um, other species feed on, so uh, they uh, thrive. You know, it, it, this cycle of um, uh, returning uh, value to the soil is, is pretty important for um, the resource use and, and so on within Australia. And one of the other interesting things is it provides uneven stands of growth. You've got pockets that are thickets, which also have value instead of an entirely, as, as much of the area is now, not being burned. It's thick everywhere. Um, but if you've got pockets that haven't been burned in a number of years, well then that's a good safe place for an animal to hide in. And it actually has advantageous, it's advantageous as a hunting technique to set that on fire and see what runs out. You know, so it has a, a value for, um, even the areas that don't get burned have value strategically for um, hunter-gatherers in that landscape. Um, so here's an example again, to sort of, this is coming from New South Wales, uh, but sort of a parkland image, we're using fire to uh, flush out game to uh, acquire it fairly easily. So we're coming on, we've only got about 500 years left. Uh, we've covered pretty good ground. Um, Post-contact period, uh, just as people are starting to arrive, lots of community. People are everywhere. Uh, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make here. Um, these are some of the groups um, that I was working with in the Northwest. And uh, so it's, it's very, um, all of Australia has been occupied. Um, First contact is probably uh, the um, Indonesian fishermen. There's reports back to the 15 and early 1600s, but the earliest confirmed based on literature is in 1720. Uh, the Makazan fishermen from Sulawesi are coming to uh, fish for and harvest sea cucumbers, which are a delicacy in China, which incorporates Australia as part of the global economy of Renaissance planet Earth. You know, it's pretty, pretty fantastic. Uh, 1606, the first uh, Dutchman to set foot in Australia, and a host of explorers uh, soon to follow. In the 1600s, there's 29, uh, sorry, 28 other explorers who have, have come. Uh, WA in 1616, um, and then the big one, 1770, is Captain Cook. Um, so we kind of know the story from there. British colony established soon after uh, with the first fleet uh, first fleet coming into uh, Botany Bay and Sydney Harbour in 1788 um, with uh, Governor Phillips, who is sort of the, uh, um, the Cornwallis equivalent um, uh, in terms of uh, his role in establishing a foothold in a new country and the uh, invasion that uh, came subsequently. Focusing a bit more on WA, we're, we're, getting, we're getting near the home stretch here uh, in this um, timeline. Uh, first settlement in West Australia is in Perth in the southwest on the Swan River in 1829. Uh, explorations into the 1860s and 70s um, continue, and that's when uh, uh, it sets up the first um, inland farming and pastoralists. And uh, as a result of that establishment from the gold rush, um, there is, you know, a, a lot of abuses to um, Aboriginal inhabitants. Um, in particular, um, there's a few massacres. There are um, people um, getting arrested because of spearing a sheep or, you know, um, just because they're a nuisance. Um, this is uh, the memorial to the Flying Foam Massacre, which is uh, near the coast, and it is a standing stone for every person that was killed. This place has power. I've been there, I took this photo. The sign requests you not to go any closer, but it hums with the energy of a memorial of people who were, you know, were done wrong. It's a pretty, 
pretty interesting place. Um, Canada became independent in 1867. For Australia, it was 1901. Um, one of the big features here is uh, in 46, Aboriginal people are, are fed up with their um, working conditions after decades of um, slave labor, essentially, uh, not getting paid. You know, get some flour and tobacco, and, and, and that's, that's good enough. Um, and they demand fair wages. This gets passed, but the farmers and people who have the opportunity to pay them choose to not pay Aboriginal people. They let them go and hire white farm hands instead. Um, Iron ore is recognized by Lang Hancock in 1952, which kicks off the 1960s industry. And from there, uh, we sort of come into the modern era, which is uh, you know, why I got to Australia. Um, land rights are, are sort of developing in this time in the late 20th century. And in particular, the Mabo case, which recognizes native title over the lands. And more importantly, the fact that it was never terra nullius. It was never unoccupied land. Um, so that was a particularly important um, consideration and establishment for moving forward into equal footing. So the Pilbara experience. This is some of the oldest landscape on the surface of the earth. These rocks, the iron ore is over a billion years old. Every year, half a billion to a billion, to, uh, well this past year, uh, 2017, it was almost 900 million tons of Australia being exported overseas. Next to iron ore is cattle ranching as the big industry. Um, it's hot. <laughs> it's dry. The, uh, some of the hydrographic information I was reading stated that all 13 rivers in the Pilbara region are ephemeral, uh, which means when one guy's comment, it was they don't constitute wetlands which is an essential thing for being a river in my experience, but apparently not. Um, so seasonally they hold water, but very rarely do they flow only in catastrophic uh, cyclone kind of events. Um, so uh, every now and then uh, these things do flow. Um, it interrupts uh, water crossings or is an opportunity to uh, clean off your headlights. Um, <laughs> When I first arrived in Australia, I had expectations when we went on our uh, you know, lunch break that we would go sit by the creek, right? Not so much. This is what I ended up, uh, my first uh, smoke break, uh, was underneath the highway bridge in the washed out gravel pit. Um, anyway, it, it, is, it is a dry, hot, and often harsh place, oftentimes harsh place. The, everything has thorns, everything has thick bark, very little forgiving. Um, every general, you know, um, flying to uh, the Pilbara from the Perth starts with a 5 a.m. Uh, at the uh, domestic airport. Um, oh, we're sort of, everything's happening at once here. Uh, but a two-hour flight to arrive in one of the mining towns of Newman and Carotha, uh, Port Hedland. Um, pick up the rental car or a mine provided uh, vehicle with all the equipment for uh, a long drive down a desert highway uh, and often a dusty one. The destination, sometimes it was hard to tell when you had arrived, uh, but uh, often was a mining camp, um, kind of echo trailer type setup with all the facilities, um, with all the facilities that you would need. Uh, or occasionally we had the opportunity to camp out under the stars in um, um, sleeping bags. If we were less lucky, we got to stay in small towns where uh, some of the considerations were not really up to standards. Um, but anyway, uh, we had our opportunities and uh, um, anyway, uh, getting on site was always a bit of an adventure. Um, we had uh, uh, often a lot to coordinate. And, you know, uh, we had our share of, whoops, share of misadventures as well. There we go, sorry folks. Um, which often led to unexpected delays and uh, issues within the job that had to be accounted for and you had to, you know, uh, budget your time accordingly. 
as archaeologists, um, we are thought of as having a life of excitement. <laughs> Most of my time was spent trying to walk a straight line <coughs> and trying to get others to follow me when we did so. So lining people up, coordinating, just trying to get straight through the bush without losing people, um, which thankfully never really happened, but there's five people in that photo and I dare you to find them all. So I think I'm walking a perfectly straight line and my GPS says I'm on course, but uh, this is not quite the arrangement that we'd started out as. Um, but all of it was an adventure and we had our fun. Uh, you never knew what you would see, what you would encounter. Uh, it was worth keeping in your heads up and your eyes down. Watch your feet, watch your hands, watch everybody else at the same time. Um, but uh, it, it, was, it was quite an experience, um, hot and hard work but uh, we, uh, we had some laughs and enjoyed our time. When sites were found, uh, it was a chance to stop. Uh, often we would gather in with the uh, um, Aboriginal representatives and traditional custodians that were with us, and we would have a look around and we would try to establish boundaries and then get into the process of recording and mapping the features uh, on the ground. Um, this could be a fairly tedious process because, as I said, artifacts were not removed. So we had to do, depending on the level of recording we were asked to do, we needed to do that uh, on site. So sometimes that was calipers, sometimes that's artifact by artifact in 39 degree weather, sitting on rock that is 50 degrees or 60 degrees. It's made out of iron and it's in the sun. It's like a frying pan. And sometimes you would literally move from foot to foot because you could feel it coming up through your work boots. On a few rare occasions, we had a chance to do excavations. The only opportunity that you really have for that in uh, the Pilbara is within rock shelters. It's the only area you've got intact sediments that have definable stratigraphy. Um, sorry, uh, definable stratigraphy that is worth the effort of excavation for um, datable material and material in context. Um, so I'd like to wrap up with a discussion of some of the sites and some of the uh, artifact types that we encountered. Uh, lithic scatters being the most common, and they range from single isolated artifacts through to uh, quarry sites, as well as some of the habitation and task sites that we spoke of earlier. Rock shelters were also quite common, uh, sometimes in isolation, sometimes in groups like we can see here. Uh, and pads, potential archaeological deposits, which is where on the surface there was an absence of artifacts, but with probes and with examining the type of sediment that was there, it had potential that if you excavated, you could find something, that it ticked all the boxes except for artifacts on the surface. Uh, but it was always reassuring when you found something like a muller um, just inside the drip line that kind of confirmed that this was not just a, a cave or a, a, a hollow in the cliff. Um, more interesting and less common and certainly new to me was grinding patches, which are similar to grinding bases, except you can't take them with you. Uh, part of the bedrock and different formations, particularly quartzite um, and some of the ironstone, uh, sorry, the dolerite was used. You can kind of see here that the, the tone is different, it's been smoothed, and certainly the, the gloss on, on those two are, are uh, very evident. Uh, in this case, the muller is actually still in place. Uh, pretty fantastic, just, you know, uh, work was done, walked away, things are still as they've been for hundreds of years. Uh, hard to know how frequently and when these things were last used, but uh, certainly a, a pretty um, special encounter. Modified trees are one of the uh, other um, sort of spe special sites, certainly for me. I've had experience with this in British Columbia with culturally modified trees. Uh, though here, it was more complex than just getting to the, the sap underneath. Most of these trees uh, don't have that same property, um, but what they do have is the uh, rotten cores hollowed out, which are prime space for honeybees. So uh, first step, cut out a container for your, your honey. 
which is a great way to gain access to the interior. So two steps in one. So wooden Yandy dishes like this would be removed uh, painstakingly. I've seen some ethnographic videos of the guy with like this just pounding away what would have taken hours in this film. And then he said, chuck that. And he just gets his ax and kind of just knocks it off and, and so on. It, it certainly would have been a labor intensive process before the use of iron tools. Um, but you can see it's quite dark, but there's a hollow here. And from there, you could ram a stick up and down. You could find out where you needed to go to get to the honey and then collect it in your uh, wooden tray. Namo holes, uh, we saw a few of these earlier. Uh, this one actually has a capstone for one, keeping out other animals so that it's there for you and also to reduce evaporation rates. Uh, there's historic sites as well that we encountered. Um, most notably, flaked bottle glass was uh, one of the common features. So sort of post 1880s generally um, and into the 19th, into the 20th century, excuse me. Um, in the middle, we've actually got some tin yandies, which are part of the mid and early 20th century mining operations. Aboriginal people uh, surface mining, dry mining, panning for gold. Um, in some of the deposits, often in conjunction with industrial operations. Um, stone arrangements and stone structures. Uh, this stone arrangement is at a site that is a thalu, which is an increased site. It's a spiritual site um, used uh, to um, the way the uh, traditional owners describe it, that this is imitating emu eggs, and it's to increase emu out on the land. So you perform your rituals at this site, and it is a sort of a powering up of that particular resource. Um, it's a bit hard to make out, perhaps, but in this, uh, the photo on the right, uh, either right, you can see a uh, cached uh, cavity. So it's been walked up, uh, sorry, rocked up at the front. Um, that is a way of, one, keeping resources. There also is uh, um, sometimes um, important goods are kept behind features like this. We didn't disturb them. Sometimes you would just see if you could identify anything by looking through. But we were always with uh, the advice of the, the Aboriginal custodians who were with us and following their direction. And many times it was young guys that just said, you know, let's stay back. We don't know. We don't want to uh, do the wrong thing here. So we'll regroup and, and talk to our elders. Engravings. Um, we don't have a lot like this, uh, but we have had a talk a couple months ago um, about uh, rock art uh, in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and so on. Um, most of this is being done on uh, ironstone and some dolerite, uh, some pretty fantastic um, scenes. Again, often associated with permanent water. Uh, one of the, the, the world's largest art gallery is located in the Pilbara at Murajuga um, on the coast. Um, the dolerite, uh, uh, the oak croppings of rock have been uh, particular properties that have been used by Aboriginal artists for the last 20,000 years. And there is, without using an exaggeration, there are over a million engravings within a few square kilometers of this feature that extends off the coast of the Pilbara. So there are, within this image, numerous engravings on many of these prominent rocks. And the landscape extends for ages. Um, just a few examples. Again, another archaic face, which goes back to some of the earliest representations. There is superimposition, which has allowed some opportunity for studying um, different compositions, different styles. Certainly, there is a recognition that many of the uh, marine images, sea turtles, fish, and so on, uh, marine birds, uh, are fresher, which ties into the fact that the sea level was a long ways away when some of the other work was being done. And looking at various weathering patterns allows at least some seriation as to what came first, what came second, even if we can't get tight dating. And there's opportunities now and then, rare as they are, for rock painting. 
Um, I was very fortunate in encountering three or four of these sites in the five and a half years I was there. Many of my colleagues didn't find any. Um, so in particular, this one cave that had uh, a number of, of figures. I don't know if you, there's a black and a white one up top, and then the black one here, which is represented in more detail. Interestingly, it seems that the black is not the original color, but a uh, change in some of the chemistry. Uh, yellow eyes and some dot patterns uh, also associated with it. Really uh, a fantastic sight. Um, so just nearing the end now, um, just want to go over some of the, the, the artifacts in particular and then we'll close. Um, grinding material. Uh, this was largely my favorite um, because it was just very tactile. Um, in this, this particular one here on the lower, lower left came around the base of a cliff and at the mouth, the drip line of this rock shelter, there it was. The muller right on top of the stone. Who knows how long it's been sitting there, uh, but it, you know, the perfect lighting, it was just sort of a pretty magical, uh, magical moment. Um, large grinding base as well. You, uh, you can see some uh, concentrated pecking in the middle, so not only are we grinding, but we're, we're doing, there's some pulverizing happening as well. And very rare, I didn't find any, this is the only one that uh, I encountered uh, at a known site, is a ground edge uh, axe. So not a lot of, that's certainly something that's a bit more common here. We have those celts and adzes and gouges and so on. Um, but heavy stone tools are not something in a highly mobile uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. You don't want to carry around any more than you have to. So uh, they have sort of a um, isolated usage. So yeah, I just wanted to put that up again. And you can see, again, just the, the, the way the polish has changed, even the shape of the stone and some of the, the, the polish and pecking on the surface of the uh, grinding base. Uh, Australian small tool tradition, we mentioned this a bit earlier, um, sort of has a few of the main components. There's tula adzes, uh, which are essentially retouch flakes mounted at the end of your woomera, which is for your spear throwing. Um, but it has a multi-component tool uh, at the end, sort of a, a chisel um, uh, woodworking element, which we would often find the discarded exhausted elements that as they get retouched, they get down to a wasted slug that gets uh, modif uh, replaced. And we would often find these as a distinguishing feature of some of the uh, larger habitation sites. Back to artifacts, we spoke on these before. Uh, they followed of use about a thousand years ago, but interestingly, some of the spear types, you, know, you could see how a number of those mounted in the edge of a spear, mounted the edge of a knife, would serve a similar function. And in fact, dislocating inside game, inside your enemy, uh, may be a good thing. It does harm, it ensures the kill. Uh, microblades, something that's uh, common in, uh, across the world, um, another element of the sm small tool tradition. Um, example of a small one here. And I put that in contrast with macro blades, which uh, there's debates on that being actually perhaps part of a historic component um, as a, in the last 500 years, related to trade with other groups who had access to iron, um, that producing stone tools that are kind of like an iron blade is a way of uh, exchange because not everyone has flakes, uh, stone resources for, for that kind of work. So this is a particularly nice one. It's actually got some retouch on it, but you know, the strong area coming down the back, um, from a large, you know, a lot of core preparation to be able to get that heiress to reinforce the strength of the flake as a tool. Wooden artifacts occasionally, um, wooden spear, uh, baler shell, um, part of uh, often hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from the shoreline used as water carrying. These would be large shells, hollow on the inside. Um, so uh, their occurrence in the middle of the desert seashells is, is certainly something that uh, doesn't happen all the time and, and is worth taking note of. Um, that's it. Just a closing remark. Uh, the Pilbara is a special place. You never know what you will find when you get out into the world. And you never know where the road will take you and what exactly <laughs> and what experiences will you will be called upon uh, to, to make that experience a success. My background in pre-contact archaeology, 
and lithics and a willingness and a willingness to risk an adventure expose me to the experiences, places, and people I've shared with you tonight. In many ways, there is common ground. As I went away, um, I met the same characters in the Aboriginal communities that I had a relationship with and met when I was in, uh, the, with the Northern Cree in Quebec. Um, I used skills and lithics analysis that I learned when I was working in Northern British Columbia. Um, the problems of the archaeologists faced throughout Canada with dealing with legislation, heritage regulations, and pushy clients were present in West Australia too. There is also untold value in maintaining your networks, your colleagues, your classmates, both young and old. We can't do it all, so it's great to build connections by others by sharing our experiences. I thank you very much for your time. So it's, it's called a Woomera. Uh, I think I can go back to that easily enough. So that is in sort of, in English, would be a spear thrower. So that was a, um, but, uh, so that is just a decorative element, um, but that would have been like the Yandy dish that was taken off a tree, similar kind of action, but less of a, less concave. Some of them are a little bit concave. Some of them are actually multi-purpose of not only a spear thrower, not only a woodworking tool, but can be used as a carrying element as well. Um, some have ridges on the edge, which has a musical property for rubbing a stick against. Um, but at the right end is a little stick that comes out that mounts to the butt of your spear. And it's an atlatl kind of launcher with a woodworking tool at the butt end. So you would hold it at this end and use that peg in the base of the spear to launch it like a spear thrower. Uh, yeah, what would be being ground in the grinding, the grinding stone? I didn't recognize any of the plants well, in your landscapes there. Oh, I was curious as to what plant foods might have been used. Sure. Or what was uh, being ground? That's fine. Um, just do this. All of that yellow stuff. <laughs> it's called spinifex. Uh, amongst other seeds, there's a number of trees that produce uh, a nut, um, you know, nuts and seeds that can uh, be processed. But the spinifex is the bane of all archaeologists' existence who have to do survey work in the Pilbara. It is essentially pincushion grass. Uh, at the tip of every blade is a tiny little barb, and it doesn't matter how thick your pants are, how thick your gaiters are, it will get in there. It's this, it's this hair-like thorn that just gets in, and it's weeks before you know, you've sort of worked them out. Um, you just deal with it. You know, I found the gaiters were too hot, but they produce uh, um, sort of a wheat-like um, seed that you can just winnow by hand, collect, um, husk and then grind into a, a, a flower for, for damper. That's a true grass, is it? Uh, I, I don't quote me on the biology there, um, but it, it is, uh, yeah, it, it, it is grass-like, you know, um, it's in the grass kind of family, um, and it is the dominant species um, throughout the Pilbara. Are there dust storms and things there? Like the artifacts just seem to be just laying there. Yeah, occasionally, I mean, there would be. I've been in a couple of, I was in one dust storm. I had a photo uh, that didn't make the cut um, just while we were in camp. Um, often there are uh, uh, willy wallies, which is sort of like a small tornado, which you can sort of see kind of is going along this column of dust. And I'm not sure of the, the meteorology that's happening there. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, there's just so little, um, there's essentially 
no soil development across the landscape. It's, it's, it changes by physical motion in terms of flooding uh, wind, but the organics don't last long enough to deposit sort of a, a humus layer like we have here. Um, it doesn't have just, just the nature of an arid landscape. There's not enough organic material uh, that stays in place that doesn't get blown away or washed away to accumulate. So artifacts and material just are on the surface and accessible, uh, which makes our job a whole lot easier because we're not carrying shovels, we're not carrying screens. I didn't use a shovel for six years. Uh, it was pretty amazing, actually. Um, but all this material is on the surface. So there would be stuff that is buried, but you would, you know, in a landscape like this, where do you start to dig? You know, uh, and often it is really dynamic. Um, it's being eroded, it's being, you know, river courses are changing and collapsing in and building up. Uh, that even if you did find material in an open site, as we describe them, its interpretive value would have to be limited, you know, and when a lot of the artifacts themselves aren't highly diagnostic, uh, the amount of work putting into subsurface in an open site really isn't worth it. You mentioned in some of your, or pointed out in some of your slides that uh, you were busy recording things, but there didn't seem to be any emphasis on collecting or Australian government not interested in, in that aspect of things? No, no. I mean, they have their samples. And we're also talking a lot of material. Um, and I think one of the factors that comes into play is, firstly, the Aboriginal uh, community doesn't want this stuff removed from country, as they say. Uh, that's where it belongs. That's where it should stay. And even in the context of, well, this is where our mine pit is going to go, this stuff does, uh, on occasion, we are asked to do, <coughs> excuse me, uh, salvage recoveries in which material are put into uh, um, plastic bags and generally they are kept in a boiling hot sea container um, somewhere on the mine site for 5, 10, 25 years from now when the life of the mine has been exhausted and it has been rehabilitated, that they will then take this bag, which may or may not have a legible label on it, and dump it back at the coordinate. That's the, that interestingly has been the approach that has been acceptable to the Aboriginal community. Uh, again, the interpretive value they have placed on understanding just distribution uh, information uh, has, hasn't been uh, a strong consideration. Um, and in some respects, I get that because um, when these sites have been exposed on the surface, they're not held in place by other sediments, they're not held in place by root mats and so on. Uh, 10,000 years of rain and floods and cyclones and winds, you know, it is going to move things around. That the micro measurements of just where things are located, you know, uh, is going to lose some of that value. So uh, why there aren't local um, repositories, you know, and better labeling, I, I don't have a good answer for that, but uh, rarely were we asked to do salvage. Mostly it was identify, define, and for the most part, the companies would try to avoid. Down the line, there might be requests for uh, subsequent work, but that was less common. Then to what extent did the uh, major people you were traveling with recognize the of their oral position of the materials that you found? Um, to an extent, I mean, uh, there's the community and then there's the community. There's the, the community as a whole um, with the experts and elders. And then there's the people who we occasionally work with, but oftentimes we're working with 20 year olds who uh, may or may not have a strong connection uh, to or understanding of their culture. And even if they did, they may not be so confident or feeling motivated to, to share and speak up about that, particularly because there are strong hierarchies within Aboriginal communities as to who can speak for country, who has the right to tell a story, to sing a song, to explain something. There's, there was certainly some considerations there. Now, uh, I don't have any good photos, uh, but there is some, some materials that we were, uh, you know, 
were common to their experience that like, yeah, that's used in the initiation that I went through. That's what we use that for. I'm going to tell so-and-so about this place. You know, because some of these sites still have active use. Stone lithic resources still have value. Ochre outcrops and so on have value today in some of the corroborees and big ceremonial uh, gatherings where they get all done up in regalia and so on. So, um, and some of these do feature in uh, song lines, which was, you know, Aboriginal culture was, you know, we'd, we covered too much tonight anyway. Um, but that kind of stuff does feature in some of the oral traditions. Uh, going back to the issue of the mining companies seeming to have their sway with the government, um, and having read about uh, Canadian mining companies and their predominant role, or primary role in some ways, in Central America, South America, Africa, and so on, Canadian mining companies are the bad boys in terms of environmental and archaeological destruction, but also in terms of the treatment of Aboriginal peoples. I'm just curious as to what extent the major Canadian mining companies are a primary source of the problem in Australia as well. Um, some of the companies that I was working for are in Canada. Two of the big ones are. Um, I can't comment on any specifics uh, in terms of, I think, you know, mining as a whole is a destructive element and requires a whole lot of um, careful maneuvering uh, to be done well at the best of times. It's pretty easy to do that poorly uh, from the perspective of environment and heritage and, you know, uh, community politics and so on. So. Uh, I don't think I can really answer that too well. Uh, I don't have a lot of comment on the Canadian side of it here because uh, Mike's focus has been in, in, uh, in Australia within the mining environment. Um, specifically Canadian companies being bad boys, as you say, well, those companies uh, weren't operating on any of the projects that I was involved with. So uh, I, I don't think I can fully answer your question. Well, no, I don't think I've got enough information to be able to give a good answer. But a lot of the projects or work that you do is in relation to mining companies and so on? Uh, it, it was. I mean, 98% of what we did was mining. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not pro anything here. I'm just sort of, my position is just that uh, there are, there are, there are ways of doing things and there's worse ways of doing things. I think in mining, a lot of it is, I mean, destroying heritage is bad. Uh, destroying the landscape has a lot of negative impacts. Um, my guess when I was talking about some of the big miners were, by comparison, by comparison to some of the junior operators who uh, didn't call us at all, there was a level of due diligence being done. Could have been better? I bet it sure could. Uh, would we like to have done more in-depth research? You bet. Um, but in the, in the structure in which we had to work with uh, government legislation that certainly weren't on the side of heritage uh, or, or the Aboriginal community, um, I have very little voice in which to be able to dictate uh, anything. So um, certainly it, it's, it's a complex issue. <laughs>